Welcome to the RD2B podcast. Each week we sit down with a different registered dietitian nutritionist to showcase the diversity of opportunity in the dietetics profession. Our aim is to dismantle the notion that there is a traditional career path. I'm Carl Barnes, the registered dietitian behind the scenes of RD2B. And I am Jenna Warnock, the RD2B host. Our RD guests share their stories, career paths, and advice to help students like us succeed in the profession. Welcome back to another week of the RD2B podcast. I'm your host, Jenna, and today we're sitting down with another recording with Dr. Josephine Connolly Shunin. She featured her program in the last episode with her, but she has such a rich, diverse background in dietetics that we just had to sit down with her again and just dedicate an entire episode to her amazing career. And so thank you again for joining us. And again, she is the director at the nutrition division at Stony Brook. And yeah, we're just super excited to dive into your career and all the things that you've learned. Excellent. I'm excited to share. Yes. And so we first want to set the stage with what made you decide to pursue dietetics as a career? So interestingly, you know, I went to school undergrad about 30 years ago. You guys probably weren't even born. Um, And it was my high school um, guidance counselor, because at the time in high school, I was very interested in health and medicine, really. And so I was pre-med, but I was trying to decide on colleges and majors. And he's like, oh, you know, Cornell has a fabulous nutrition program and it's a great way to uh, prepare for medical school. So Cornell has a fabulous nutrition division department. And so I majored in nutrition and really fell in love with nutrition. And then I just decided to stay with nutrition. And I'm glad I did. Awesome. Yeah. And then you also progressed your um, education farther into a doctorate and specifically in sociology. And so where have you found that having that doctorate in sociology has helped your career as a dietitian? So, yeah, great question. So first, Jenna, I um, went through undergrad. You know, back in that day, you know, I was the first one in my family to uh, even think about a master's degree. And it was harder to get information, right? It wasn't social media and uh, the the information you have at your fingertips now with Google, you know, that didn't exist back then. So I was going through my undergrad and approaching the senior year. And at that time, the concept of internships was kind of new. You There was another plan, another way you could uh, prepare yourself to be an RD. But at Cornell, they were very research focused and we weren't really... Um, We didn't have a seminar that talked about how to become an RD. I was just a nutrition major. And so I decided then to go on for a master's degree first. So I applied for a master's degree. I had no idea about the idea of being paid for a master's degree. So many of you may know, but some may not, that if you pursue a graduate degree in sciences, you often get paid. So it has so evolved, I believe, my experience is, and with my own children who are about, you know, 21 to 25, um, that you need to commit to a doctoral degree if you want to avail yourself of um, assistantships, basically. So when you apply to graduate school in the sciences, there is this concept of research assistantships. So if you apply to a school where they have lots of grant money, big nutrition departments, and you're serious about your graduate education and you you know, think you're going to pursue a PhD, you apply for the PhD. And then they pay not only for your tuition, but they pay you a stipend each semester. So if you're going to go on for a graduate degree, that's something to consider. Um, and then, so so when I was doing it, uh, so I had two offers and I remember opening the letter that I was accepted into the graduate program and seeing that they were paying me. And I was totally excited. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that was a thing. So, um, so it is a thing and you can keep that in mind, but it does limit the schools you can apply to because we have a fabulous master's program, but it's not a research master's. It's a more of a clinical master's. So there's no um, master's thesis. It's a capstone project. So that's something to think about when you're applying to graduate schools. If you, Well, now we have to have a master's, right? So many of you will uh, think about doing a master's that is um, more of a clinical master's and then you're paying for the supervised experiential learning and or clinical rotations if it's a DI. Um, and then that that's a lot of money. You could, if you plan ahead, um, apply and, and consider a doctoral program. Many doctoral programs um, allow you to earn a master's along the way. And then you could decide 
to leave after the master's or to stay and pursue the PhD. So there's a few things to think about, um, not to talk you out of my master's program, because we have a fabulous DIMS, you know, pursuing a PhD is a long haul. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But initially, I was not thinking that I just was going to do the master's. And then when I got to Penn State, which is where I did my master's, I learned of this concept of clinical rotations and um, supervised experiential learning to apply for the registration exam and sit for the exam. So I, I was did not know about all that when I was doing my undergrad. I just loved the field of nutrition. I applied for the master's and then I'm like, oh, okay, well, this is how you become an RD. Uh, so then I, you know, when I was at Penn State, I did clinical training at Hershey Medical Center and my public health rotation and research rotation at Penn State. So that's how I then became an RD. So then I'm practicing as an RD and I, I work hard. I like to work and I love the field. And so I'm working really long hours and um, developing the division here at Stony Brook. I'm like, you know what? I should do, I should invest in myself. You know, maybe I'm not going to stay at Stony Brook forever. Maybe I might, you know, move. I, I never did move, <laughs> but you know, if you do the doctoral degree, that's your, you know, I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to be working at night. Maybe I you know, should take classes and earn a PhD. And um, that's something I can always take with me. So I pursued the, the doctoral program, um, but I had been practicing for quite a while. So I already had two kids and long story, which, you know, it, it was very hard to find a program that I can accommodate with two kids, right? There were no PhD programs on Long Island at the time. I was working full time. Honestly, I couldn't afford to not work and do a PhD. And I had two kids and my husband worked here. So I wasn't going to like, you know, move, move anywhere. So, um, so I looked at opportunities on campus at Stony Brook. Um, so there was, there's still no doctoral program here in nutrition. So, um, I ended up at sociology. I had taken a stats course, not a trick at, in sociology and a great statistics course. So I found an advisor. So when you're doing graduate work and you're thinking about what school to apply to, you want to look at the faculty, look at their bios, what kind of research do they do? Because you're going to be spending some time doing research, especially if it's a master's thesis kind of master's, not a clinical master's. And certainly if you're going to do a PhD, and so I found a um, researcher who was willing to work with me to study the social production of pediatric obesity in our country. So it was it's a sociology degree, but my um, dissertation was all about pediatric obesity um, and how we produce pediatric obesity in this country, the way we serve food in uh, to kids. Uh, this was like, again, a long time ago. Um, so there were not as strict rules on school lunch programs. There were rules, but it wasn't as like it is now. And there was an incredible use of food in the classroom, right, for parties and food as reward. And there was tons of food being used for fundraising. So kids, you know, we're, we're teaching kids one thing about food and nutrition, but then we're like, here, do this candy sale to raise money for the track team, <laughs> right? So it's so incongruous. Or, you know, you're going to get Skittles if you do so something on your math test, right? So my whole dissertation was about that and then also how parents also want the school to establish really healthy environments in the in the school, but yet at home, because of kids scheduling and whatnot, running from practice to game to theater practice and whatever, people are running by fast food, right? They're not prioritizing healthy food at home either. Um, and the food industry and how they influence nutrition guidelines by uh, NIH and Department of Health and, and Human Services, honestly, you know, big dollars in lobbying, et cetera. So I put all that together to create this model about how we are, we are making kids overweight. We are producing obesity in this country. So my advisor, I remember, so with, uh, when you get a PhD, there's a hooding ceremony when you graduate. So he, he hoods me. First, he was very young. So I walk, I, I was older than him. So I, we walk into the ceremony and the, they assumed I was the professor and he was the student. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm the student. So he's hooding me. He's like, I didn't really make a sociologist out of you. I said, no, but you made me a really good nutritionist that has this appreciation for sociology. So sometimes you have to look around and, and you know, we have lives and we have other things going on. And a doctoral degree, very few people ask me what my degree is in. They just know I'm Dr. Connolly. I have a PhD. And so that really is the most important thing. You learn how to conduct research and you learn about critical inquiry. And the fact that it's in nutrition is important, but you know, you learn a lot of skills that you can bring to the table. So here at Stony Brook Medicine, 
if you are interested in working in a medical center in an academic environment, then you know having a PhD is really essential now. You used to be able to get away with a master's, but really now it's a PhD that's required. And then if you're working at a medical center, if you want to work in the highest level of uh, clinical practice at a teaching university hospital, if you have the PhD, you're on par with the MDs. It's a terminal degree, like a like an MD is a terminal degree. So it's Dr. Connolly and it's Dr. whoever, who's the physician. So in terms of committee assignments and salary and um, credibility, in a medical center, the PhD is is necessary. So I wouldn't be able to function at the level I'm functioning at without a PhD. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I think it's great how you stated, yes, while I had a doctorate in sociology, I still made it nutrition related. And like, but you were still able to get that diverse education through that mm -hmm. doctorate degree. And so with the graduate degree requirements for 2024, would you recommend students to have that diverse educational background? Like for example, getting an MPH or an MBA or just kind of sticking to dietetics and just, you know, because like with what you said, to get on par with MDs, get a doctorate, but then MDs go through how many years of medical training and it's like consistent medical training, but with the 2024 requirements, we can get it in kind of whatever. And so like, what advice would you give for the future of dietetics regarding the graduate degree? So the way the field has evolved and what we are doing in hospitals, I will say my master's is in nutrition. My PhD is in a different field. So you you go through your undergraduate degree and you think you know a lot and you do. But when I was first starting the master's here and writing the courses, like I developed a lot of the curriculum, I was learning so much. And I had already been in practice, oh, who knows, like 10, 12 years, something like that. Um, the, the field is so deep and the breadth of uh, subjects in our area is so wide that I do, if you want to practice clinically at the highest level you can practice clinically, you need your master's to be a nutrition because there is so much more you need to learn in terms of nutrition, physiology, and genetics. And it's just an incredibly fascinating field. And I still, I, um, I'm updating my lecture on, on liver detoxification for this course I teach now. And I'm reading these new articles. I'm like, oh, I finally, finally you know, I'm 58. I've been in this for a long time. I finally understand secondary bile acids. Like I am still learning. There's so much to learn. And I feel like, you know, if you, if, if you want to practice clinically, I really strongly believe your, your master should be in nutrition because there's a lot more that you have to learn that you don't even, even know you don't know after finishing your undergraduate degree. Then if you want to do a PhD, um, you know, you can widen it a bit. It wouldn't have been, if I could have done the PhD in nutrition lifestyle wise, I would have, honestly. It would have been easier too, because when you switch fields for your PhD, I had to take so many classes because it was a new field for me. I had to take like, I don't know, I don't remember, but something in the neighborhood of like 30 credits of sociology classes. So if I had just stayed with nutrition, you know, PhD in nutrition, I wouldn't have had to do so much coursework. It would have been faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so it's kind of that balance of nutrition is such a wide field that you can still progress your graduate studies toward nutrition, but discover so many different niches that fit your interests particularly. But then again, you know, if you're going in and you're just like, I want an MBA, I don't care what anyone mm -hmm. else tells me, you know, go ahead and get that MBA. But it's just like, mm -hmm. if you're worried about, you know, oh, I'm just sticking to nutrition for the long haul. It's great that you mentioned there's so much that we don't know at the undergrad level that it's great to progress that much more. And you didn't mention how you pursue your PhD because you wanted to invest in yourself. And so there were a lot of topics that you wanted to like cover particularly in this interview. And one of them was investing in yourself and your education. And so for you, your example was in that doctorate, but how can current students just like myself or the listeners ensure that they'll do the same in the future? So one of the best ways to invest in your training and also give back to the field is being involved in your local dietetic association the and also the practice groups. So, you know, I tend to be very honest. So I know there are a lot of people that have mixed feelings about the, Acad the National Academy, but man, they do some amazing work. And I've been involved at the higher levels in the state, not the national. And I'm looking at all these women who are still volunteering 
and they're like in their 60s now, and with such awe because they are really helping to fight for our licensure, which we still don't have in New York State, but also Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement for nutrition therapy services, um, a lot of the malnutrition, whole um, uh, identification of malnutrition, which you know, it really has become a big role and responsibility for RDs and hospitals, which is associated with revenue. We never made money in hospitals. Like we, nutrition was part of room and board, right? It's part of your just being in the hospital. But now when we are identifying malnutrition and working with the physicians to diagnose it, we are helping the hospitals bring in millions of dollars. So my chief financial officer you know, if I see him in the hallway, he's like, I know, I know, nutrition brings in $3 million. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, Gary, a, a year, <laughs> $3 million a year. So, you know, it really gives us a seat at the table. It gives us credibility. So, yes, you, there might be some things that we're uncomfortable with. They, and the Academy has cleaned up a lot of things, partnerships with industry and stuff. But still, it happens. Um, you know, I went to Fancy and I still see fast food and, um, you know, people exhibiting. But if you're if you don't like that, then you need to change it, and you change it by joining the organization. You change mm -hmm. it by working to change it and changing the policies. And um, so, yes, you might have some differences, but the only way to change that and improve it is to become part of it. That whole organization is run by volunteers. So I strongly encourage people to join. And I have met the most interesting, smart, um, accomplished people who are part of the practice groups. So. The Academy is a big organization. We have practice groups in integrative nutrition therapy, cardiovascular, sports, practice groups uh, by specialty. And by joining those practice groups and all of the practice groups need um, people to volunteer to be on the board. There's really been a lack of participation, not just in nutrition, but in a lot of professional organizations. It seems like that's not such an interest uh, among the new practitioners, I'll say. So, um, that I learned a lot. And in terms of uh, developing skills that you can then apply to your work site. So I, for sport, for cardiovascular nutrition, I was on the editorial board for the newsletter. So I wrote and edited a lot and developed my writing skills, which now when I have to write my business plan for my metabolic kitchen, which I have to do this week, I have uh, you know really honed in my technical writing skills or speaking skills. Like if you volunteer to speak, or if you are on the board and you have to run the meeting, or you are the sec the um, secretary and you have to write professional emails and write up the minutes and send them out. You learn so much. And there are always other people on the board who have more experience, who have been doing it longer, who teach you and help you. So in terms of communication skills, leadership skills, as well as content, nutrition skills, if you're active in the practice groups or each state has a practice group, like New York State Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, and then there's either county or regional groups under that. So I've been on the e-board for the Long Island Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, um, New York State. Um, for a while, I was um, on the board. Now I'm like a task force uh, chair. Um, so investing in those organizations also helps you invest in yourself. So people will be like, you know, Josephine, why, why, why do you do this? And I, I had an awesome chair of my department who would say to me, you're good. You do all this. Why do you do all this? And it, because I, I, because I'm so passionate about the field and I want to expand the field. Right. So you have to always check in with your reasons, but I would always say like, what are other people doing at night? So if I'm up and I'm writing a grant or writing a strategic plan or other people are watching TV for most nights of the week, maybe on social media, so on the weekends, I go out, I go dancing. I love New York City. But, I, I, you know, during the week, I'm okay to to do work that is um, advancing the profession and my skills and my division. So people uh, have this very, interesting. you know, I have younger kids and there's always this like kind of new approach. I'm going to say new, like in the last five to eight years about work-life balance, right? And um, people think... You know, if you work as hard as I do, that you don't have that. But there is a way to have it. You just have to have it like on a few nights a week, not every night of the week. Or, you know, I had three kids. I, I did my PhD and I had two and I had third along the way. <laughs> so it took me 10 years. It took me a very long time to do my PhD because I had three kids. Um, so you have to find the work-life balance that works for you. But, you know, think about how you use your time and when you're creating that balance, maybe you, as long as you enjoy the work, because I don't ever see it as a, a negative, right? Because I love the field. So if I'm writing a lecture at night, I'm like learning about secondary bile acid metabolism. I'm like, wow, that's so freaking cool. <laughs> right? So as long as you're passionate about it, it doesn't feel like 
a hardship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's great that you highlighted the, whenever you are working towards something like progressing the profession, it shouldn't feel like work in the process, especially if you enjoy what you're doing. And I think that's a big thing. And like what I've learned of what causes burnout is usually burnout happens when you're constantly devoting emotional energy, your time energy, just everything into something that you don't fully believe in, or you don't fully have your complete attention towards. And so whenever, if you do genuinely want to invest in yourself, it makes perfect sense, especially career-wise, to invest yourself in, you know, state affiliates or like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And we've definitely heard from other people before the importance of investing in that program, because just like with what you said, a lot of people say that they don't have a lot of time but they do have time to like, you know, if you really want to do it, you will make time in the day to do it. And so I Mm -hmm. think it's great how you highlighted that for sure. And like, just the like work-life balance, you can work hard, but also balance your life in between as well. And like another thing too, that you wanted to cover was the importance of working hard early in your career. And so like, can you kind of touch on why that specifically is important and what that can look like for a dietetic student? Yeah. So, so like I mentioned, I did my PhD when, when, after I had two kids. So my daughter's now in a PhD program and she's like, mom, I'm going to do that. (laughs) before I have kids. And it would have been smarter to do that. So if you're going to do a graduate degree, if you're considering a PhD, you know, you have to do the master's now, but, you know, do it earlier. Start, like I volunteered a lot for the Long Island Academy of Nutrition Dietetics uh, before I had kids and when I had my first kid. And then when I was doing my PhD and working, I didn't volunteer as much. So there's going to be times in your life if you choose to have children when your kids are little that it's going to be and you're working, it might be harder to volunteer at that time. So you want to develop a good network and um, invest in that network early on. And then you might need to step back. You might have a sick parent. You might have, you know, some other things that you have to do, but but people know you and you have your network and then you could step back in. So I think it's important to try to get your graduate work done early and develop a, a, a strong professional network. And if you need to step back for a little bit, it's okay because you've developed a lot of those skills, you have that network, and then you could step back in. When I was here at Stony Brook, I started at, under someone else's grant, and it was a five, it was a three or five, it was a let's say five year grant, and it was getting near the fifth year, and I'm like, oh, I kind of want to stay at Stony Brook. So I had been volunteering for Long Island Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and there was a dietetic internship director of another program that I had worked with on the board, and I said, you know, I think I'm gonna, I want to you know, develop a dietetic internship. And she's like, okay, meet me here and I'll, I'll tell you exactly how to do it. <laughs> and she helped me create my self-study, the, the plan for the first, um, when I first got the dietetic internship started in 1995 uh, or 96. Um, and if I hadn't volunteered for the Long Island Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, I would not have met her. I would not have been able to do that. And that really, you know, kind of cemented my career here at Stony Brook. So it's hard to even know um, ahead of time where those connections and networks are going to come into play and how they're going to help you, but they will. Yeah. And it's like a great safety net. And also I think you just highlighted just how important networking is because from, you know, all, like I've been, I've had the like privilege to interview so many different dietitians and talk about networking with them. And almost every single time they bring up networking, they're like, I would not be where I am today without them, but I would have never known at that moment connecting with them that they would bring me where I am. And so I think it is great to see how it's benefited your professional career and also how networking led you to create, like be, being able to be successful in creating a dietetic internship like Stony Brooks and also going to plug our other episode where we completely cover your program. You have expanded it greatly into three different tracks and offering it to so many different interns, both distance and on site. And you've just made it the super complex program with, and it all started with what you said, volunteering. And I think mm-hmm. that's great just to highlight with networking, skill developing, and just like what you can get out in the long run. And um, just kind of going back into networking, it can sometimes be translated into having to build an effective team or working with a lot of different people, especially multidisciplinary, like in a clinical setting, for example, you know, you're a doctor just as the MD is, and you all can be working on the same projects. And so what I've seen, especially as a student, a lot of aspiring registered dietitians are type A, we're kind of like OCD, like to 
have control over a lot of projects. And so what advice would you give students that struggle with wanting to overtake a group to accomplish a goal and to hopefully benefit with networking in the process? Hmm. Interesting. Um, so how to be a team player, right? Yeah. And especially because like, you know, the whole multidisciplinary, that's yeah. kind of moving so, on. You know, I, I think we have to check in with our egos and make sure that we value and understand the training of the other team members and what they bring to the table. You know, I am from New York. I am pretty assertive. And a lot of times I have to really stop myself from talking. I have to be like Josephine <laughs> in my own little head. Like I have to, you know, stop and just make sure I'm not um, stepping on people's toes or giving other people an opportunity to talk. And, you know, of course you learn from other people that way. So I have uh, over the years, um, you know, grown the team here and such fabulous, fabulous people that work with me. And um, yeah, and I, I think as we grow, you learn that you have to delegate because you can't do everything well and nor should you, right? So um, as you learn to appreciate and assess other people's skills or even, you know, with my team, what do you like to do? And, you know, uh, these ASIN paperwork that we have to do for accreditation. So one of my um, faculty members likes, you know, I really like that kind of technical writing. I'm like, good. <laughs> so we need a program change form. And, and so really learning about other people's skills. Um, in a clinical setting, it's, uh, it's very team driven. It's hard to it's hard not to appreciate the rest of the team. Because if you're in rounds, for example, the respiratory therapists have you know, a body of knowledge that they're going to add and nursing and, but, you know, in terms of respecting other people too, like initially when I first started overseeing the inpatient team, I hadn't really spent so much time inpatient and I wasn't really understanding and appreciating the nurse perspective. And I started to go to some nursing meetings and, you know, I may have had to present something, but you stay for the whole meeting, right? And you listen to everything else. I'm like, wow, they have so much they have to think about all the equipment in an ICU, right? And, all the orders that come in and I had a really a new appreciation because we were like frustrated that the I's and O's, the intake and output part of the chart, we did a little study where we were reading um, from the pumps, the amount of tube feeding volume, tube feeding formula volume that was being delivered. And we were comparing it to the I's and O's and we're like, their I's and O's are not accurate. And so, you know, so we go to nursing and like ready to tell them this. And then you're listening at a meeting, you're like, you know, and they'll tell you, well, do you want me to take care of the patient or you want me to make sure that I have the eyes and nose exactly right? <laughs> well, you know what? You need to take care of the patient. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to estimate. Yeah, I think it's about 50 cc's per hour. Maybe it was 45. Maybe it was 40. And yes, it is important. But when you appreciate everything else they have to do, it's really hard. So you're like, yeah, OK, I get it. <laughs> Yeah, definitely understanding the big picture and like, yeah, look with what you said, kind of checking the ego and just, you know, blatantly, it's not always about you. And yes, we all bring an important, like, you know, you studied for many years as a registered dietitian and in nutrition, but they studied a lot of years in the areas that they're special in mm -hmm. and all of them still like integrate into just one patient. And so yeah. it's like, you know, you can't have one person specialize over one patient. It's like five people specializing on just one concentrated thing. And so, yeah, that's a great thing to take away just with team building and everything in general. And so, yeah, so we talked about networking and we talked about team building and now it is kind of like wanting to take the good part parts of focusing on yourself and with what you mentioned on reflecting on short-term and long-term goals. And so just kind of focusing more inward now instead of outward. And so you're a big proponent of making short and term, short and long-term goals and reflecting on them throughout a process and just overall improving yourself personally and professionally. And so do you have a goal-making method that you use for long-term and short-term goals? So I'm going to speak in terms of goal setting for my division and then for myself, right? So yeah. um I have a great chair too, like a, another great chair. So my other, the gentleman about checking with ego, he retired. Um, but she has us every year set goals and she doesn't really have to do that, uh, but she does. And so I do it, you know, with her. So I'm like, well, I want to submit two proposals, grant proposals, because I want to focus more on research this year. Um, or I want to make sure I submit one paper and I can, you know, manuscript this year. Or I want to develop the GI group uh, for patients with functional GI disorders. So it's kind of a process I do with her, but you do learn to be very realistic because I'm going to meet with her again in a year. <laughs> so did I do that? And then you're evaluated on how you how well you achieve your goals. But we do this with patients too, right? When we want them to shift their eating styles, 
I tend to give them a full nutrition plan, but then I'm like, okay, this is a lot. You're not going to be able to change it. You're not going to be able to go from what you're doing now to this plan completely next week or tomorrow. So let's set, uh, usually I do two short-term goals. So a, a food one, nutrition, food and nutrition, and one exercise one. So set very short. So what are the smart uh, smart goals, right? So uh, measurable, specific, within your control, time constraint. So I do that with my goals too. Like, is it really, is it specific? Is it really doable? And how will I know if I did it or not? So, you know, being very specific and realistic, because I think sometimes when we set goals for ourselves, we're, we think we're being realistic, but we're really not. And then it can be disappointing, right? So you, you want to make sure that they're realistic and doable, like a little bit of each doable. So what I do with my group is we set five, we create a five-year strategic plan. Most institutions do this too. So you want to see if your institution has a five-year strategic plan and then try to be in alignment with that strategic plan because that's how you get resources <laughs> for your division or your department. Mm -hmm. So we're in the midst now of creating our new five-year strategic plan. And one of the concepts that's a little tricky to get across to your team is that your strategic plan goes above and beyond what you're currently doing. So you have your day-to-day -day duties and responsibilities. I need to see 12 patients a day. I'm going to do their nutrition assessment, nutrition-focused physical exam. I'm going to write a nutrition plan. Some patients are going to be following up and monitoring how their plan is going. But now if I'm going to take a leap, either personally or for my group and as a division, I have to think strategically, what's the next thing I would want to do and in the short term, you might need to take on extra work in order to then get extra resource. So your strategic you, your personal goals, you might stretch yourself, your team, if it's for your division, I'm asking my team to maybe one night, if I ask you to write this paragraph for the business plan for the metabolic kitchen, that you will do a little extra. And then if everybody does that, then we could start pushing our division and our um, function in the institution a little bit more, get a little recognition. And then I could circle back and say, we're doing this, this, and this. I need another line. I need another line. Or when we started doing the malnutrition focused physical exam, I want to give my staff a 3% raise. So people tend to push back, right? They don't want to do more. They want to do their work, do it well, do it very well. But then when they go home, they want to go home. I'm like, okay, but that's not going to help you grow. And that's not going to help the division grow. But there's going to, you know, I can't make people do that. I, you know, they're, they have their work day, but you'll find in your institution that, or your group that some people want to do that. And they want to take the extra step. And then sometimes I have some of my staff members are like, you know, I don't think my salary's fair. I, I'm like, well, you know, if you can help me stretch a little then, and we get a new program, maybe a new, um, uh, we, I call it Target Fitness. We have a Target Fitness weight management program. Well, if we can do it for GI, and at first we just do it as an add-on, we just suck it up and do it. But then I ask for more resources. Well, then I can give you increased duties and responsibilities and get you a non-contractual raise. So we're, we're unionized here. So if you're in a union shop, your raise is based on the contract. It doesn't it's not reflective of you individually, sadly. Um, so, but I can give you a raise if you are taking on an, an increased duty and responsibility if you're helping do something more. So a lot of times people are like, you know, I'm not going to work an extra half hour. You know, I'm not getting paid to do that. I'm going to, you know, whatever. They go home. And then I know some people will be a per diem or um, to make a little extra money. But to me, that's short-sighted because now you're driving someplace else as eats up time. And, uh, you know, being a per diem, when if you just kind of stay here and develop the division a little bit more, there might be a promotion for you and there might be increased duties and responsibilities. So that's just something to think about. Or if you're interviewing for a job and you're trying to come up with some interesting questions, um, you might ask, you know, um, so is there room for growth? Are there any special projects you're considering that you want to expand? Um, asking if they have a strategic plan might be a little assertive. And if they don't, they might feel bad saying that or you know, so you might just want to say like any, is there room for growth? Is there room for program development? Don't talk about money until you have an offer. Um, but if you're the kind of person that you want to stretch, you want to increase your knowledge base. And then, you know, at some point you might want to move and 
go someplace else and then you'll have a new skill set and you'll say, you know, I developed this new program and uh, it brought in this much money. And so it's kind of investing in yourself, investing in your division, your department, your institution in a way that helps everybody. Yeah. And I think it's great how you implemented like how goal setting is able to get you there. And so like specifically regarding your career, since we're talking about like, you know, professional goal setting, were there any moments that you were working hard towards a goal and realized that it wasn't exactly what you were looking for? Like you were kind of going through the motions and you were just like, okay, I thought I was going this way, but I actually found that this way is better. And so if you ever had that experience, uh, how did you address that realization and then like modify it for the future? And you can use this, like, you know, applying it in your division um, Mm -hmm. goals that like the division plan that you've outlined, or just, it could be something, um, you know, anecdotal or anything like that. So at, at one point we started to teach a, in a in another master's program. So there was another master's program here and they had a new, and we said, okay, we'll do a nutrition concentration. And it was in a different school. It wasn't the school of medicine. So we were doing that, but we ended up saying, you know what? I don't think it's great to have a concentration in this other program. It was a smaller school. So we were a bigger fish in a smaller school but when we jump to the school of medicine, it's a big school, right? So now we're a small fish in a big pond. Um, but it was a good move, I think. It was a little hard at first and to get people in this big pond <laughs> to recognize our program and to think about us. Um, but ultimately, it was a good decision. So, yeah, and that was hard because you didn't want to walk away so- from something you had started um, and already had some traction but we made the decision to move over. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you have to kind of reevaluate and and stopping and re and redirecting is hard. So, mm-hmm, definitely. And so, like, what specifically made you guys realize that moving from that college was a good direction for you guys? Because we really think we we wanted a clinical concentration. So we really thought that being with them medical school would help us grow our programs in a way that's attractive to the students that we wanted to come to our programs. We have a clinical concentration at Stony Brook for all of our graduate programs. It's a clinical concentration. So it was really helpful to us to be in the School of Medicine, um, even for some interprofessional activities we do with the residents or the medical students. It was best for us to be in the School of Medicine. To align, yeah, to align the clinical work and the and our our interest and passion in clinical nutrition. I gotcha. Awesome. And so uh kind of talking about your and you did mention this before, you've been in Stony Brook for over 30 years, which I think is definitely admirable just for any career in general, just being somewhere for 30 years. And then seeing <laughs> how you've grown the program is also equally as admirable. And you did touch on it a little bit. But just kind of to make it a summary, just so that listeners hearing can maybe take home, okay, what are some signs of maybe I should stay somewhere long term? Because, you know, you hear a lot of different dietitians being like, oh, it's okay if you work here for three years, work here for two years, like it's okay to hop around. But if someone's interested in like, okay, what are some signs to stick somewhere long term? What specifically motivated you to stay at Stony Brook for so long? Because they supported my crazy ideas <laughs> to move forward. I mean, I I had I was very fortunate to have chairs of the department. So first it was Department of Family Medicine, then we merged with Preventive Medicine. So now we're the Department of Family, Population, and Preventive Medicine. So I was very fortunate to have chairs of our department who were very supportive and gave me the platform to grow the nutrition programs and really believed in nutrition. So if you're at a place where there is room for growth, that's key. Um, I'm also going to say just from a from a parent, mentor parent perspective, something that I don't think um, younger people think about is pen is um, not a pension, but your retirement accounts. So when you get a job and you get the offer because you only ask about benefits after you have the offer secured, then you can ask about well, what's the benefits package like. So they, many institutions, many companies will put money in for your retirement into an account, um, a retirement account. And then you want to ask, well, can I match that or can I put money in as well? So if you can put money in and they match that plus 
then you start to grow this retirement account, but they only let you, the money that they add or they contribute to your retirement account on your behalf, you only get to keep if you stay a certain number of years. So if you keep leaving every three years, that money that they were putting into your retirement account goes away. You don't get it. And it sounds not important. Oh, I'm young. I have time. But there's this, you, you know, the in, the idea of compounding interest. <laughs> so you put money away, there's interest, then that grows, and then there's interest on the bigger amount, the bigger amount. So you're watching your retirement accounts. This is really important. You got to really <laughs> think about this. You're watching your retirement accounts, and early on, they're growing slow. Like, it doesn't seem like a big deal. And you're, you know, people think, oh, I'm barely making it. I can't put money away. Put put $20 away, put something away. And then over the years, and I'm 58, I've been here 30 years, it's the compound interest. You're like, whoa, that's really nice. <laughs> and the, it, it's like snowballs. It really does snowball. And if you move around a lot, you don't get that. And you don't get to, it's called vested. So when you stay long enough, different companies have different rules about how long you have to stay to get vested. If you keep moving around and you never get vested, you lose, when you, when you're ready to retire, you're not going to have the money that you want to have when you retire. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. And then kind of talking in on that, like, oh, it's really good to find somewhere and like stick with it long term. If someone isn't really sure about where specifically they want to go in dietetics, how would you recommend they kind of find that balance of wanting to make sure that I find a good place to stick with and making sure it's somewhere I definitely want to stick with um, long term? So would you recommend them kind of like, shuffle around a bit for a couple of years to figure out what they want and then kind of level it out. Yeah. So okay. the, in, first of all, the internship, or if you're doing a future education model, the supervised experiential learning courses, you're going to go to a few different places, right? So you really want to focus and you really want to see and talk to the RDs that are supervising you about what's it like in a acute care hospital? What's it like in a community hospital? What's it like in renal or bariatric center, center, et cetera. So you want to try to find a program that gives you a diverse opportunities for those supervised experiences and then really kind of focus. And then if you're also part of your regional dietetic association, you'll be with dietitians in all different, you know, areas of practice and different settings and talk to them. You know, what do you like about working there? What do you like about working at a um, a place that's unionized versus non-unionized long-term care? You can go in really early and leave early. Um, Outpatient, people love outpatient, but that might be after uh, evening hours and weekends when people who have insurance have the time to see somebody. Um, so during your training, for sure. And then when you graduate or you get your RD, it's going to depend a little bit on your situation, right? So if you're in a, most of us are going to be in a financial situation where we need to get a job. We don't, we can't wait for the perfect job, right? Because we need a salary. So, um, you know, you might have to take a job that's not the ideal job for you, but you're going to stay active. You're going to be at the local academy and you're going to talk to people and you're going to see what, you know, what jobs, you, you might learn about jobs before they even get posted because people talk, oh, I'm going to have a position open in such and such. Um, if you're in um, long-term care, but you want to get to acute care, don't stay in long term care too long because when we interview people we want people with acute care experience so then you might want to say okay i'm in long-term care i needed to get a job that was what was available but i want to go to acute care so i'm going to be a, a lot of acute care places have per diem positions so on the weekends you get some experience in acute care and then therefore when you want to apply to a opening in an acute care hospital that's near you yes i have long-term care experience but i've been a per diem because i know this is my passion and i really sought out that acute care experience so i knew it would be important and so you, you know, you, you can per diem in different places to get some experience and kind of get a sense for other places uh, and what it's like while you're working full time, which I know is a lot of work. Again, it's an investment in yourself so that you really see what you like and prepare yourself to get your dream job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's great how if the extra work that you're doing is working towards what your genuine passion is. It's like with what we mentioned, it shouldn't feel like work and it shouldn't feel like extra stress. If anything, it should be invigorating you to keep pushing and to keep finding what you want to stick to, which I think is really great. I want to make sure that you realize too, it's important to exercise. It's important to eat well. I have, you know, I, I, I'm at a healthy weight now, but I used to be 60 pounds heavier when I was a lot younger. So I, you know, I really, I'm not a thin person by nature. I have to eat really well. I do my food prep. I shop once a week. I roast tons of vegetables on the weekend. <laughs> um, me too, me too. 
<laughs> I exercise. I always have exercise. So that's really, really important. And, um, and you know, if you choose to have a family, that's, you know, something I'm just going to put my mentoring hat on again. Like, um, I have three kids and I loved being a parent. I loved being pregnant. I loved breastfeeding. I loved all of that. Um, but I found very good childcare and I, um, I, you know, I picked my kids up and I was present, you know, if I, on the weekends, you know, this little club we belong to and I, I'm the mother in the sandbox and a lot of other parents aren't in the sandbox. So when I'm home, when I'm with my kids, I am a hundred percent there. It's like a hundred percent. And I put them to bed late because I got home at like five and I, they'd go to bed at 10, 10, 30 because we'd hang out and play and do homework and whatever. And, um, yeah, they were okay. <laughs> They're 21, so, 25. They, turned out they survived. <laughs> uh, so I remember asking them, my, my oldest one is actually 27. And he said, so if you're looking back, mom, would you do anything different? And um, well, I said, would you have? So first I said, I would have been, I would have been nicer to my husband <laughs> because, you know, you're just kind of managing, right? So I, it'd be like more about, yeah, you don't have, you don't have that much time for each other per se, because um, you're always with the kids. But I said, w did, would you have wanted me to do anything different? Would you wanted me not to work or to be home one? They're like, mom, you were so in our business. Like, no, it was fine that you were working. We needed a few hours with in childcare or after school programs or something. So people will give you the impression that you can't, or people will say, oh, I, I didn't work for a while. I was raising my kids. And okay, but I really raised my kids too um, by being very present and very mindful with the time I was with them. So, you know, they would, when they were little, they would sit at the kid. And I have a picture I love of my son. He's on a stool with a white plastic bag. He's got a onesie on and a white plastic bag that I had cut a hole out to, so he wouldn't get soaking wet because I'd put them at the sink and they would wash vegetables or I probably gave them knives way too early but like they would they would sit and cook with me and they didn't that was fine I mean yes cooking take a little bit longer but having that kitchen be the focus of the family not when so when I came home with them we were together you know I have a, a friend who has a really big house and she's like well the kids just go to the bedroom my kids never went to their bedroom they were always in the kitchen doing homework or helping me or in the den like as a unit, right? That might be harder with social media these days. I know it's a, a challenge I didn't really have to deal with so much, but you can work full time. You can have children. You can raise your children. Um, volunteer a little on the side, but that's why I said do it early because when you have kids, you do need to shift that focus a little bit. Yeah. And I'm glad that you focus the family aspect and balancing, like balancing family while balancing your ambitions because you can be ambitious and also have personal goals, like raising a family, making sure that, you know, you have good, like, you know, good ambitious kids following in your footsteps as well. And so, yeah, like definitely being present and being present, not only for your children, but also for yourself, because, and I love how you highlighted, you know, be present and take time for yourself, you know, exercise, eat healthy, like follow what you tell your patients and clients yeah. to do as well, because you'll also benefit, which I think is really, really great. And we have been talking a, uh, you know, good about young professionals, like people after they get the RD credential and they're just out into the workforce. And so kind of cycling it back to dietetic students and, um, you know, the goal setting that you mentioned and you, and also your strategic plan. And so, with what you've learned from your strategic plan and just planning in general for your professional, like, you know, situation, wherever you are, how can dietetic students apply components of your strategic plan to their current situations to be perfect, like, you know, to be professional? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if this is going to directly answer, but one thing I always encourage my kids to do, and it's along the lines of strategic planning or goal setting, but in a little bit creative way, more creative way, is to to create a vision board. So um, a vision board is just a visual representation of your goals, right? So, and I do this with patients too. So if your vision is to become an RD or to have a certain experience or whatever, you put a visual representation of that and maybe some positive um, quotes and and whatnot. And, and it, but it has to be physical. Like it's not on your phone. It's actually a physical thing. And you put it someplace where you will see it every day. And the idea is that that reminder helps you, and this is how I say it to my patients, help you make your micro decisions, right? So um, 
uh, you know, I'm very honest with my kids. And I'm like, okay, mom, so before I pregame for the party, I'm going to study for the GREs for an hour because they, you know, graduate school is uh, is a goal. So, and that's on the vision board, right? So um, <laughs> my son had a girlfriend, they broke up, whatever. And, and he goes, mom, I got everything on my vision board except the girl, but he got, but then he's, but then he got it back. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's it's it helps you to make little decisions each day that are going to help you to get to that goal that you visualized. So, yeah, I, I want to go out, but I'm going to do I'll go a little late to the party or to the frat thing or whatever, because I'm going to do I'm going to exercise first because that's my goal. Or I'm going to, you know, spend the hour studying for the GREs or I'm going to look into that local association because there are student members, too. So you can make that goal setting process a little bit more creative by creating these vision boards. And I'm sure that if you Google it, there's lots of different examples and whatnot. But I think that's a really cool thing to do and helps you to really maybe more subtly manage your time so that you're focusing on those goals that you've now visualized. I love mm -hmm. the concept. Yeah. And I actually did that in 2021. I just like did, I went on Pinterest and I just like typed all these like different goals and things like that. And I made it profession or like professional oriented, yeah. like registered dietitian, you know, I want to like work community nutrition research, things like that. And what's really great is like just seeing it. I was able to get accepted into like, you know, uh, I was in community college and I transferred to undergrad. I got accepted into the undergrad school that I wanted to go to that awesome. was community nutrition, you know, based and things like that. And like having that vision board, I started it early and I can already, even though like it honestly helped starting it early because I, everything's been just like slowly falling into place just with establishing and like seeing consistently this is where I want to go. And then of course, checking in, is this still where I want to go given what I've experienced? But then like, you know, after evaluating, making sure it's where I want to go, it's been really helpful with just like guiding my, me and like my goals and also making sure that, you know, we don't get lost in the sauce. Like that's yeah. just like, you know, the saying mm -hmm. where it's like where life happens like with what you said, but also, you know, not wanting to think 30 years down the road. Oh, I really wish that I, you know, did what I, I really wish I went to grad school or, you know, have starting my family or like, you know, moving here, things like that. And so it's really, I'm really glad that you focused on just, you know, create that vision board because it'll visualize your future and like make mm -hmm. it much closer to being real, which I think is great. And so we covered- Can I interrupt for one second? Because you said things oh, fell into place, but they didn't fall into place on accident. They fell into place because you took the steps to make them fall into place. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the vision board probably helped you to do that. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I think that is one thing that people do like under, not under, under realize that's not a word, but like don't realize is I am a firm, you know, some people are firm believers of everything happens for a reason. Like, you know, everything falls by um, design and things like that, but you know, you also contribute to your mm -hmm. future as well. Like you, you are the one that dictates when you hit apply to that one program that you really want to do, or whenever you hit submit for that scholarship application, like you still are the one dictating what happens in the future, which, you know, it's, it's good to have that sense of security of like, say that you get denied, you know, from that thing that you apply for using everything happens for a reason, because you don't know what the future may hold. And so like with what we've mentioned, it's definitely a balancing act in, you know, with work life goals, everything like that. And yeah, just definitely personal and professional, it can be applied in both, which is great. And um, so we've covered like literally so many things about your career from networking to, um, you know, your strategic plan, working in groups and just like, you know, long-term, short-term goals. And so is there anything else about those topics that we just haven't, didn't touch on as much as you wanted to, or just any last remarks about those topics that you wanted to cover? I think you did a great job, Jenna, in um, guiding the conversation. And I, I just say, enjoy the ride. Like, in, enjoy every single day. Like, really enjoy the ride because life goes so fast, right? And oh, yeah. by by being present, um, and it you know it helps you to just enjoy every moment. You know, it really, really does. I mean, I'm I'm now towards the end of my career, like another six or seven years. Not that I'm counting, <laughs> <laughs> but and I look back, I'm like, it's been awesome like it really is you know so just you'll get out of your career and your personal life what you put into it too right so um you know it relationships take a lot of work relationships with your kids with your spouse or your significant other and and your team at work and but uh it, it all comes back to uh 
really help build a career and a life that you're happy with and, and proud of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think those are great words to end on. And so, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Josephine. We were really happy to have you again, just talking about your amazing career and the awesome advice you have for future dietitians. And so again, thank you for taking time just to talk about all of the amazing things. Absolutely. Thank you, Jenna. This has really been a pleasure.